scattering on a transmission line. So the topics in this video, of course, we'll talk about scattering at an impedance discontinuity and calculate a reflection coefficient. That actually leads into a discussion about power on a transmission line and then the voltage standing wave ratio. And this is analogous to when we talked about plane waves, we had a standing wave ratio. Now on a transmission line, since we're doing things in terms of voltage and current, we call this a voltage standing wave ratio or visvoir. Scattering at an impedance discontinuity. So this is a common cartoon, if you will, for a transmission line. And while it seems to imply some kind of parallel wire transmission line, it's really a cartoon representing any transmission line. This could be a microstrip, a coaxial cable, or anything else. And we're characterizing a transmission line with a complex propagation constant and a characteristic impedance. We really only need these two things to do calculations with these transmission lines. So the question is, what happens when we connect a transmission line with one set of parameters and butt that up against a transmission line with another set of parameters? Well, it should be no surprise from our previous discussion with waves that we will get a reflection. So let's go ahead and look at this and derive an expression for the reflection coefficient. The derivation of this will parallel very much what we did for plane waves, but I will repeat this again in case you haven't watched that. So the first thing we do is we write our expressions for the voltage and current in both transmission lines. So in transmission line one, we're writing the, the subscript one. And of course, we have a forward and a backward wave. Our current, we're writing in terms of the amplitude of the voltage divided by the impedance. And we have a forward and backward wave. Now, in the second transmission line, we really only have the forward wave because there's no second interface to produce further reflections. So we only have the forward wave. And we only have the forward wave for the current. And we're expressing that as the amplitude of the voltage divided by the impedance in the second medium. So that's our starting point. The next thing we'll do is we'll look at the boundary conditions. The voltage and current have to be continuous across the interface from one transmission line to the other. So we can write that the voltage in transmission line one right at the interface has to equal the voltage in transmission line two right at the interface. And the same with the current. So then we'll grab our expressions from the previous slide and write them in. This was our voltage in the transmission line number one, and this was our voltage in transmission line number two. Likewise, this expression was our current in transmission line one, and this expression was our current in transmission line two. The next thing we need to do is recognize that this is happening at z equals zero. And so if we set z equals zero in all of these exponentials, we get e to the zero, and they're all just equal to one, and in fact, they drop out of the equations. So immediately right at the interface, those complex exponentials disappear, and we end up with two much simpler equations. And we will proceed with these. Now let's derive the reflection coefficient. Notice I'm using this symbol gamma instead of little r. They're really talking about the same thing with the, the amplitude of the reflected wave relative to the amplitude of the applied wave. I just like to use gamma to remind myself this is a transmission line and not a plane wave. So we have our two equations from the previous slide. The first one we derive from the boundary conditions for voltage and the second one we derive from the boundary conditions for current. Well, the first equation is an expression for V2 plus all in terms of V1 quantities. Well, over here in the second equation, here is that V2 plus term. Let's take these, this expression for V2 plus and plug it in over here. Now we have an equation completely in terms of the V1 quantities, the V1 minus and V1 plus. Then what we can do is we can separate the single fraction into the sum of two fractions. And so we end up here. 
Now we notice that we have a V1 minus term on opposite sides of the equation. Let's bring all the V1 minus terms to the left and all the V1 plus terms to the right. At this point, we can factor out the V1 minus on the left and the V1 plus on the right. We can simplify this a little bit. If we multiply both sides of this equation by Z1 times Z2, that brings us here. At this point, we can bring our V1 plus over to the left. We can bring the sum of impedances over to the right, juggle the terms around, and we end up here. And this actually is our definition for the reflection coefficient, which is the amplitude of the reflected wave divided by the amplitude of the applied wave. And we get Z2 minus Z1 over the sum of the impedances. So like we did for waves, we're concluding here, fundamentally is a change in impedance that causes reflections. And so the actual impedance of the line, other than some of the issues we talked about before, the actual impedance of the line isn't so important. What is important is when the impedance changes. Most of the time we don't want that because that causes reflections and we're losing power. Other times, as you'll see, we actually do want that because we're making filters and other types of elements. Now let's revise our equations for the total voltage and total current armed with this concept of reflection coefficient. So we have our voltage in a line, which has a forward wave and a backward wave, and we can do the same thing for the current. We have a forward wave and a backward wave. We're just writing it in terms of the amplitude of the voltage divided by impedance. Now that we're armed with this reflection coefficient, we now know that the amplitude of the reflected wave is simply the amplitude of the forward wave times the reflection coefficient. Likewise, the amplitude of the reflected wave for the current term is the amplitude of the current term for the forward wave times the reflection coefficient. Now we have some terms that we can factor out and we can end up with a much more useful form. We factor out the V naught plus and then inside the parentheses, we have two exponentials with a gamma term multiplying the backward wave exponential. And down here, we have the V naught plus over the impedance. And then inside a similar thing with our two complex exponentials, but there's a minus sign here instead of a positive sign. We're now in a good position to talk about the power on a transmission line. So from circuit theory, the average power at any point along the line is one half times the real part of voltage times current, where we take the complex conjugate of current. And I'll add that this equation is valid no matter whether the line is lossy or not. Now let's have a lossless line. When we have a lossless line, there is no attenuation. That alpha term disappears from our complex propagation constant. And where we used to have an e to the minus gamma z, now becomes an e to the minus j beta z. And likewise, where we had an e to the positive gamma z, now becomes an e to the positive j beta z for our backward waves. Now we can write this, even if we're connecting our line up to a resistive or lossy load, we've just said the transmission line itself is lossless. Okay, so now what we can do is take these expressions for voltage and current and plug it into our definition for the average power at any point on the line. So we plug in those functions, we take the complex conjugate, do all of our math, and the average power turns out to be this. Notice this is no longer a function of z. I didn't write p average as a function of z. z has canceled out of that equation. And that's because that's a lossless line. Power is flowing uniformly along that line and does not decay. And typically the stretches of transmission line are quite short, and this is a really good approximation. For very long stretches or high loss lines, you know, we need to do a better job of this and keep our complex propagation constant. Now let's talk about the voltage standing wave ratio.
When we discussed standing wave ratio, when we're talking about plane waves, we really took our time and did that methodically. So that discussion applies here 100%. We're just calling this a voltage standing wave ratio because we have voltages and currents, but the concepts are all the same. So on the reflection side of an interface where we have a connection between two different types of transmission lines, on the left side, the reflection side, we'll have a applied wave overlapping a reflected wave, and we get something called a standing wave. And we'll see lots of simulations of that in a little bit. We'd like to define the, the severity of that standing wave. And so what we can do is observe the maximum voltage of the standing wave divided by the minimum voltage that we observe in the standing wave, and that is our voltage standing wave ratio, or VISWAR. Now we could do the same exact thing for current and get the same thing, the same number for visoir. Let's derive an expression for that. So we have our two expressions for voltage and current on a line in the presence of both a forward and backward wave. And in this case, since we're using the reflection coefficient, this backward wave is due to a reflection from a discontinuity. So now we calculate the magnitude of the voltage as a function of position. So we're trying to calculate the magnitude of this first equation. And we end up here. Then we want to know what is the maximum and minimum voltage based on this magnitude. And what we can see is that it will have a maximum when this complex exponential is a positive 1. And so we end up with a 1 plus the magnitude of gamma L. This will have a minimum value when this complex exponential is a negative one, and we have a one minus gamma L. So now we have expressions for our minimum and maximum voltage that we can then go back to our definition for visoir and calculate an expression. So our visoir is the max V divided by the min V, which we now have expressions for. The numerator and denominator now both contain the magnitude of the amplitude of the forward wave, so those will cancel, and we have our final equation for calculating visoir. And if you remember from waves, from plane waves, this is the exact equation we had for standing wave ratio, except we had 1 plus the magnitude of little r. But as I mentioned, little r and gamma are really the same thing. So we can turn this around, we can solve our visoir equation for the magnitude of the reflection coefficient, and this gives us an easy way to measure what that reflection coefficient was, because that's not very easy to measure, not impossible, but not easy. It's much easier to measure visoir. So we can measure visoir and then figure out what the magnitude of the reflection coefficient was that caused that visoir. So here's our first animation. We have a 50 ohm transmission line, and at the end, it's terminated with a short circuit. So we are showing a load here, but it's actually a short circuit, just connected with a wire. So if we look at our voltage, the voltage is zero at the end, and that's because it's a short circuit. We can't have voltage across a short circuit. So our applied wave is shown with this green line, and of course that reflects off the termination, and the gray line shows our reflected wave. And if we add the two together, we get this blue line. And the blue line is oscillating up and down, but notice it's not moving left and right. That's why we call it a standing wave, because it's standing still. And it fluctuates within this envelope that we're showing with the dashed blue line, and that never changes. If we look at the current, we can have current through a short circuit, so the current is not forced to zero. In fact, the current can has its full swing here. It can go high and low. Now, just like when we talked about standing waves with waves, if we back up a quarter wavelength, now the voltage is swinging its maximum. And if we go down and we look at the current, it's at a minimum. It's not fluctuating at all. And this repeats every half wavelength. Now let's look at the case where we're reflecting off of an open circuit. 
So we have an infinite impedance. The reflection coefficient is a positive one. Since it's an open circuit, we can have a voltage, and we see our voltage swinging across its maximum here. Well, if it's an open circuit, we can't have current. And so notice our current is fixed to zero here. But if we back up a quarter wavelength, now the current is fluctuating its maximum, and the voltage is not. The voltage is zero a quarter wavelength away from the termination. And all of this repeats every half wavelength. We'll also point out, when the voltage swing is minimum, when the standing wave of the voltage is minimum, the standing wave for current is a maximum. When the current's a minimum, the standing wave of the voltage is a maximum. So they're kind of opposite in that regard. And that's always the case. Now let's look at a case where we have just a purely resistive load. And I chose 16.5 ohms because that gave a reflection coefficient of 0.5. In fact, a minus 0.5. So what does this do? Notice our standing wave does not go to zero. If we look at the envelope, it does not go to zero for voltage or current. Why is that? Well, since the reflection coefficient is a 0.5 or a negative 0.5, the reflected wave is weaker than the applied wave. There's not enough of that reflected wave to cancel that applied wave completely to get to zero. So our standing wave does not go to zero. But still, our standing wave is not moving. That envelope is not moving left and right. It is standing still. And the standing wave, but it does fluctuate up and down within that envelope. The other conclusion we made still hold. Where we have a minimum in the voltage standing wave, we have a maximum in the current standing wave. Where we have a minimum in the current standing wave, we have a maximum in the voltage standing wave. And all of this repeats every half wavelength. Here we have another purely resistive load. Here I've chosen 150 ohms, and the reason I chose that is so now we have a positive 0.5 reflection coefficient. Things look similar, except before we had a minimum for the voltage at the load and a maximum for current. That has reversed. We now have a minimum for the current and a maximum for the voltage. But everything else really stays the same. This whole situation where we have a maximum swing or a minimum, it repeats every half wavelength. And the maximum of voltages is still the minimum for the current standing wave. The maximum of the current standing wave is the minimum of the voltage standing wave. All of that stays the same. Now let's look at a complex load. This not only has resistance, but it has reactance. All of, almost all the properties of the standing waves are the same. The minimums of voltage is still the maximum of current. The minimum of current is still the maximum of voltage. The main thing that has changed is that we don't terminate on the load with a minimum or a maximum. It's somewhere in between. So the impedance of the load is really just shifting the position of our standing wave and affecting the severity of it by how strong the reflected wave is. But that's it. Minimums of E correspond to maximums of I. Maximums of E correspond to minimums of I. It repeats every half wavelength. And the distance from a node to an antinode is always a quarter wavelength. Here is another complex load. And all I did was swap the sign on the reactive part. And what we can see is the determinations, what the voltages and currents we're doing, have essentially swapped between this and the previous slide. Uh, everything else about a standing wave is the same. It repeats every half wavelength. Minimum of E corresponds to maximum of H. Maximum of E corresponds to a minimum of H.